you know, for the whole semester, I have all the solutions posted. I believe that this is one of those sections where that, there, it's a lot, like my videos are like maybe a couple of hours long. Yeah, it's a, this is a long homework assignment. But I expect that you're gonna go through those homework problems. That way when you get to the final and I give you one of these and I ask you for interval of convergence, you're not, you don't just run the ratio test. Because if you just run the ratio test and stop there, well, you've done missed half the problem, haven't you? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it'll give you the interval, but it won't give me the endpoints. And as we could see, that's half the work was finding the endpoints, right? All right. <clears throat> now we shift gears. 8.6. Representing functions as power series. So we are going to start to we are going to start to uh, get ourselves in position to turn sine of x into its power series. Turn cosine of x into its power series. We're trying to position ourselves to do that. This is the first section that gets us started with that. All right? So how do we turn a function into its power series? Well, we're going to start with the, with the very basic example. And as you'll see when I do it, yes, we'll see that yes, we can convert some functions into their power series, but it's a very limited um, group of functions that we're allowed to do it with. So let's do this. Um, do you agree with this? If I take this series right here, do you agree that that's a power series? Is that a power series? Okay. Where does it appear to be centered? Yeah, because that looks like x minus 0 to the n. Uh, what does your c sub n out front appear to be? It appears to be 1, doesn't it? It's 1 for all of them. So if I wrote this out, this would be like 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus dot, 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 forever, right? I have, I, I claim, I claim that this is equal to something, all right? I claim that this is equal to 1 over 1 minus x. And I want you to think about why while I step out for a second. Anybody get it? Why that series would be equal to that? No? 
It's okay if you didn't. Just say no. We didn't figure it out. No. No. Okay. So let me let me see if you recognize this series. You recognize that series? As what? What series is that? That's a geometric series. That's when I first introduced geometric series, this is the way I started it, right? And we said that this geometric series would converge so long as what? The absolute value of R has to be less than 1 for this to converge. And what does it converge to? If, it, if the absolute value of R is less than 1, what does it converge to? A over 1 minus R, right? Okay? So, do you see that this is that series? A is what? 1. And we're just replacing R with X. Right? So A is 1 and R is X. So this should converge to A over 1 minus R, right? So long as what? The absolute value of? x for us. So this is true if the absolute value of x is less than 1. Do you all see that that series is just that series? Yes? Now, what I'm trying to get you to really see here is that if this right here were given to you as a function, f of x equals 1 over 1 minus x, you could now turn it into this series. You could convert this function into this series so long as you're keeping your, the number that you're plugging in here, absolute value of it, less than 1. So like for example, if I ask you for that function, what is f of 1 half? Then you're going to do what? 1 over 1 minus a half, which is going to turn out to be 2, right? Agreed? What I'm saying is that if instead you took one half, as long as the absolute value of that number is less than one, which it is, and plug one half in here, one plus a half plus a fourth plus an eighth, blah, 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 forever, that would converge to two. All right? Now you may be saying, well, why in the world would I ever want to do that, right? Like, I can just plug it in here and get two, right? Okay, right? But what if I ask you what sine of one is? What are you going to plug that into? Right? You don't have a closed form of a function to plug it into. But if I gave you its power series, you could, couldn't you? That's the idea here. So even though it may not seem valuable to us that we can convert this function into a power series that we'd never want to, um, the whole idea here is that we could, right? So with that idea, let's see if we can't figure out what this is. I'm going to give you a different function, and I want you to tell me if you can convert it to, its power, to a power series. So find a power series for f of x equals 1 over 1 plus 3x. So what I want you to kind of burn into your brain right now is this idea that if we see 1 over 1 minus x, right? I'm going to replace x with u because it's more general. If we see 1 over 1 minus something, that this turns into the sum n equals 0 to infinity of u to the n so long as the absolute value of u is less than 1. So this is the exact same formula I just had on the board, but I replace with all my x's with u's, right? So can you make that look like this? How? 1 over 1 minus negative 3x, right? You'll see that's the same thing, isn't it? So now it looks like 1 over 1 minus u. u here for us is negative 3x, yes? So this will turn into the sum n equals 0 to infinity of negative 3x to the nth power if 
the absolute value of what is less than 1? If the absolute value of negative 3x is less than 1, right? Which would just be th uh, 3 times the absolute value of x would be less than 1, which means the absolute value of x would have to be less than 1 third. Right? So this, this, means, this means this, but then that I can divide both sides by 3. So doesn't this give you a radius of convergence? This is a radius of convergence. So that means, uh, well, that's the power series, right? We're on our way to the power series. I kind of got sidetracked here. Um, this, this would mean, though, that we're centered here at 0, aren't we? And that 1 third and negative one-third here, that in here, inside here, this function looks exactly like this power series. If I graph this and graph this, they look exactly the same. All right? Uh, one more thing. We're not done with that power series. I want, you to, I want to make sure you've written that power series in a, in a general form like this. So that right now is not written that way because you have negative 3x inside, right? So here's how I'm going to do this. Sum n equals 0 to infinity, negative 3 to the n, x to the n. Now it's written correctly. Because this part right here is that, right? And then this part right here is our c sub n, right? Okay, let's do another one. It says find the power series. So here's the power series. This is the power series. But you have to also include this part right here. That that is only valid when the absolute value of x is less than one third. Let's do another. You seem to be enjoying this. <clears throat> oh, yeah. OK, so how about this one? <clears throat> X to the fourth over 5 plus 2x. And things are going to start getting interesting now. Got to make it look like this, right? One on top, x to the fourth on top, that's a problem. So why don't we do this first? That's legitimate, right? Is that okay with you? Okay. Now, let's try and rewrite this so that it looks like 1 over 1 minus u. So first thing I'm going to do is this. You tell me what goes under there now. 1 plus 2 fifths x. So what I did is I factored a 5 out of both of these so I could get a 1 here like I need. When I pull out a 5 out of the 2, it has to become 2 fifths. And that can just go out front. And now I can turn my plus into a minus minus, right? So this will become 1 fifth x to the fourth times 1 over 1 minus negative 2 fifths x. Which should equal. 1 fifth times x to the fourth times this infinite series. n equals no, no. n equals 0 to infinity of what? Negative 2 fifths x to the nth power. Let's split it again. 1 fifth x to the fourth sum 
and equals zero to infinity, negative two fifths to the n, x to the n. Now, we should make sure we understand that this from here to here is only true when? I can only convert that over if, if you guarantee me what? The absolute value, negative two fifths x must be less than one, which at the end of the day becomes absolute value of x less than five halves. So I can trust that you can split that up and then multiply both sides and Okay? I'm not done, yeah. I, I just wanted to make sure before we get too far away from this that we understand that this step can't happen unless we're guaranteeing that our x is within this domain. That's a big, I mean, because this is where we went from function of x over to power series, right? And you can only go from here to here if we guarantee that, that, that we have some, some radius of convergence for our x. All right, so what do we do here? Think, think about this, this sum right here. If I asked you to find this sum, you would start plugging in values of n, right? And you would get like something plus something plus something and forever, wouldn't you? And out in front of it, you'd have a one-fifth x to the fourth. And then you could distribute that through to each one, couldn't you? So like if I plug in, let's say, let's say we plug in n is three, this would become x cubed, right? But then when, like let's say that's sitting out here, then we hit it with this, it's going to become x to the what? Seventh, right? So basically every one of these, we're going to be adding four to the power of x. So that x can just go in algebraically, just go in right here and become an x to the fourth. And so when you put the two together, what do you get? x to the n plus four. So my next step is to bring in, I'm going to bring the one-fifth in there also. Now the one-fifth, be careful with the one-fifth. You cannot put the one-fifth together with the negative two-fifths. Why? Because it doesn't have the power n on it, right? So I bring the one-fifth in here to set it next to this one. The x to the fourth hits the x to the um, n and becomes x to the n plus four. This is our power series. All right? So. Any questions on that? I'm going to see if I can't get this computer to graph that for us. Because uh, I just made this problem up. Uh, so we want it to be, the original function was x to the fourth over 5x plus 2, or 5 plus 2x. Um, Give me just a second here. So let's check this out. What I have graphed here for you is the function x to the fourth over five, five plus two x, okay? That's the, the red one. What we said is that this series right here will basically be that red function so long as the absolute value of x is between where? Or, sorry, the absolute value of x is what? Less than five halves. Now five halves is what? 2.5? So if I go out to 2.5, here's 2.5, and go to negative 2.5 because it's centered at zero. How do I know it's centered at zero? That's just x, right? So if I look in here, this series should be good, right? Let's let it roll. 
here it comes. Okay. I think it's doing a fantastic, well, it did a pretty good job over here, right? The dotted ones, you can see it's kind of marched its way on top of that. Over here, it's doing a really good job. It's trying, it's trying to land itself on top of this. It's going back and forth between them. And it looks like it's going to try to do it, but we already know that once you get to 2.5, like I can't go, I can't go anywhere past that. That's the best I'm going to get is up to here. But again, with the minus A that we talked about last class, if I'm more interested in the function over here, I just move this whole thing over and then it would work. Does that make sense? All right. Good. I feel like this is going better than yesterday's class went. What did you say? Awesome class? I said, I said alpha class. Oh, alpha class. <laughs> I, th I think I'm presenting it better. I, I, I should have started the class last time with those images instead of just getting right into the definitions. I have, a, I have a question for you. Let's say we let f of x be equal to this power series. Okay, we've got a general power series centered at a. And let's say that R, capital R, is greater than zero. Now, what do I mean by that? My radius of convergence is bigger than zero, which means that this function makes sense on some interval. So what were the three possibilities we could have with the power series? It can converge at a single point, right, A, everywhere, which would be negative infinity to infinity. And the third option, some interval, right? Could be like this, right, like open here, close here, or close, close, right? These are the three possibilities. Do you agree with me that in this case right here, if th th that it has a radius of convergence and it's bigger than zero? Do you agree with that? Do you agree here that it has a radius of convergence and it's actually bigger than zero? Yes? Yeah. Technically, it's bigger than zero. And then what about the radius of convergence here? It is zero. OK? Because it's only good at one point. So you can't go out in each direction. Yes? So let's say that I give you a function, a power series. I'm, t I'm saying, hey, look, everyone, see this power series? It's a power series, and it has a radius convergence that's bigger than zero. So that means that it either exists on the entire number line or it exists on an interval. All right? There it is. Question for you. What is f prime of x? What's well, a function, right? We like taking derivatives of functions, don't we? Well, this isn't as bad as it looks, all right? You're actually really going to like this, I think. So let's write out what f of x is. So I want you to actually start plugging in, you know, n is 0, n is 1, n is 2, n is 3, and let's see what would happen. If n is 0, what do we get? c sub 0 times something to the 0 is 1. So just c sub 0, right? Next one. C sub 1, x minus a to the 1, OK? Plus c sub 2, x minus a squared. Plus c sub 3, x minus a cubed. We'll go one more. C sub 4, x minus a to the 4th. And plus blah, 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 right? That's what f is, the original function written out. Now take its derivative. So when you take a derivative of, of something, We've already learned that if it's addition and subtraction, you can do them individually, right? So what's the derivative of a constant? Zero, OK? So that's gone. Now, this is a constant, right? Attached to a function of x. So it comes for the ride, c sub 1. 
But then we have to take derivative of, of this with, with respect to x, right? So what's the derivative of x minus a with respect to x? No, the derivative, not antiderivative. Okay, let me help you. What's the derivative of x minus 4? 1, right? <laughs> derivative of x is 1, derivative of that is 0, yes? yes? Okay, so now if I ask you what's the derivative of 5 times this, 5 would come to, for the ride, and then this would be 1, yes? Okay, so do you all agree that the derivative of this was 0? Derivative of this whole thing is just c sub 1, right? Plus, now be careful on this next one. How would this change if that was squared instead? 2 comes out, right? 2 comes out, then this to the first power, then the derivative of what's inside, which is still 1. So this next piece should be 2 c sub 2 x minus a to the first power. Plus, next one. 3, c sub 3, x minus a to the second power. There's a pattern here, right? You see it? Next one, 4, c sub 4, <coughs> x minus a cubed, plus dot, dot, dot. <coughs> now, here's the challenge. Can you help me write this? as a power series. And I will help you a little bit by just pointing something out here. You see this C sub 1 right here? Could I write x minus a to the 0 next to it? I could, right? Right? All right. So let's take a look. What's the pattern you see here? Or do you see a pattern? Look at the coefficients here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I'm going to need something to be going up, right? Starting at, starting at 1, then 2, then 3. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to start at 1. I'm going to start at 1. And then I'm going to go n here. That will take care of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, right? And I started at 1, not at 0. Now tell me about the c's c sub 1, c sub 2, c sub 3. So this, the index here, or the subscript, is the same as the number out here. So how about c sub n? Okay, and then everything else is x minus a to what power? It's 1 less than where we're at. So n minus 1 here? Right? Shouldn't that do it for us? Wouldn't that create it for us? Now, there's something pretty awesome if you look at this now. If you go back up and look at that power series and look at this power series, do you see what, what, how they're related? You could have just taken this n, dropped it out front, and subtracted 1 from that. Isn't that the power rule, basically? One little slight difference, though. We started our index at 0, didn't we? I mean, at 1 here, not at 0. But that's what happens. If we take the derivative, drop the n out, subtract 1, that's the derivative of a power series. So it's very simple to take the derivative of a power series. Wouldn't you agree? And this index, oops, infinity. Um, this index being 1 seems to be a problem. But let's just, let me ask you something. What if it was 0? If it was 0, would it still give you the same thing? But So what would happen if I did just, just add the blue, say, hey, look, I'm going to change that 1 to a 0. Does it still provide me this list? So if n is 0, what happens? 0, it kills off, right? So when n is 0, you actually don't get a first term. But then when n is 1, what do you get? 1, c sub 1, x minus a to the 0. So you get that. And when n is 2, you get 2, c sub 2, x minus a to the first which gives you this, right? So do you see that just, so, just happens because of the way the formula looks? We could actually switch this to n equals 0 
and it would have no impact on what the sum actually is. We get kind of got lucky there, all right? So with power series, this right here is called term by term differentiation. All it's saying to you is what you already knew coming in here, and that's if you've got a bunch of terms separated, right, addition, subtraction, that you can differentiate term by term, even if it's an infinite series. Well, <clears throat> what do you think we can say about integration? What would you hope for? Yeah, so let's see. I'm not going to draw it or write it all out, but I'm just going to provide it for you, all right? If we're given this power series again. Why do you think this was important? I, I never mentioned this, but why do you think that that was important, that we had a radius of convergence that was positive? Think about a function. If this is my original function, and I wanted to know the derivative at x, I, that's really trying to find the slope of the tangent line, isn't it? And to do that, we need to do, to do a limit. The derivative is a limit. And if you go back to Cal 1, limit h goes to 0, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. That's the definition of the limit. And what it required was that we approached from both sides. We approached from both sides. Well, if your function is only defined at a single point, well, there is no left and right to come in from, right? You have to have some interval at least so you can start approaching. All right, that's, I just wanted to point that out. Let's get to the integration though. If this is it, what would we hope for? What would we really hope the antiderivative of this would be? If that's f of x, what, what would we really, really hope that the antiderivative would be in terms of a power series? Well, if the derivative was just bring out the n, subtract 1, what, do you want, what would you want the antiderivative to do? Yeah, you would want it to do exactly the same thing as the power rule did for us back in uh, calculus, right? That's what you would really hope for, right? Plus one, right? Uh, plus, yeah, I forgot to put plus one, right? Plus some constant, right? Plus some constant. So we still have a constant of integration. We know that when we do antiderivatives, we can get a family of functions, not the entire thing. So I'm not going to show this. It's true, though, all right? So we have what's called term-by-term -term integration also. Do, do you all see that this C sub n is almost like a distracting piece of the problem? It's a constant. So really, you're just doing, you're doing power rule for differentiation, power rule for integration. That's what you're doing. The C sub n just comes along in the formula. It doesn't get changed at all, OK? Yes? So when you do antiderivative, you don't really pay attention to the x minus a, or stuff that you see as a. Let's just do, let's say I was trying to do the antiderivative x minus a, let's say to the seventh power. Okay, so I'm going to break, I'm going to take this right here and break it up into a bunch of different things, right? Integrate each one. Let's just say you pick one somewhere out there. I don't know, like this, and I ask you to find the antiderivative of that. Okay, what you would do is a u substitution. u would be this. du would be dx, because derivative a is 0. If you rewrote the problem at this point, this would become u to the 7. And then dx would become du. And the antiderivative of that is 1 eighth u to the eighth. Right? And that's u. So it would become 1 eighth x minus a raised to the eighth. So it does, in fact, work. It's because this is linear and because that's a 1 that this all works. All right, now, last, I, I know I only have five minutes, but six minutes, 16 minutes. I'm seeing if you're paying attention. Fine power series. 
So we, we had done a couple of problems where we found the power series, right? I gave you a function, we found the power series, and then I stepped away for a second, showed you term by term differentiation, term by term integration. Now back to this. I want us to find the power series for the function 1 over um, 1 minus x squared. Now I have to move fast because I only have six minutes. So I think some of you are going to look at that and um, don't write this down, are going to think maybe you can do this, which I agree is true. I mean, that is a true statement. That's, that's the same exact expression, isn't it? And then each of these, isn't that that special, you know, 1 over 1 minus u? So this right here would become a power series, right? And this right here would become a power series. But the problem is you're multiplying two power series. So how do you multiply two power series? We haven't done that. It's not easy. Adding, if this was an infinite list of things, plus this, then you just, there they are, right? You just put them together. Multiplication is foil, right? Like a foil. How do you foil an infinite amount of terms with an infinite amount of terms? See? Yes? Okay, so this is not okay. So how in the world are we going to do this? I have to show this to you for the first time. No one ever sees this without see someone showing it to them first. I want you to notice something. Unless someone does see it. No? Someone see it? What is the derivative of 1 over 1 minus x? Well, that's the same as the derivative of 1 minus x to the negative 1, right? So if I brought this whole thing up, that would be this. Take its derivative. What do you get? Negative 1 comes out. 1 minus x to the negative 2 times derivative of what's inside? Negative 1 again. So the negative and negative become positive, and this just becomes 1 over 1 minus x, that entire quantity squared. Right? So I had to make this problem very special so that it worked. But we now recognize, hopefully, we recognize that this expression, this function, is just the derivative of 1 over 1 minus x, right? This is the derivative, right? This is the derivative of that. Now, this in here is 1 over 1 minus u. So this is sum n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n, so long as the absolute value of x is less than 1. So it's OK for me to turn the inside of this into this, right? So long as the absolute value of that is less than 1. Now, I still haven't taken the derivative of it, though, right? But now I'm about to. OK, so I'm going to take the derivative. What is the derivative of this? Sum. So how do you take the derivative of a power series? N just comes out, subtract 1, right? Now, if we start at 0, this new index is either going to be 1 or we said it could be 0 also, right? 1 or 0. I'm going to leave it as 1 just because for something that's coming up later, all right? I'm just going to say n equals 1 to infinity and then nx to the n minus 1. There we go. This is the power series of this. So we had to recognize that was the derivative of something, and then from that we said, oh, well, what's that something as a series? There it is. Oh, take the derivative, took the derivative, there it is. And if we wanted to, we could write this out. This would be 1 plus 2x plus 3x squared plus 4x to the third plus 5x to the fourth. Just plugging in our different values of n. So I have, I have found a way to turn that function into its power series. All right, we have 30 seconds. So let me just finish with this. With what we're doing in 8.6 so far, we are not done with 8.6. 
All right, we still need to do some more. What we have done is very limited. Like we can only turn certain functions over into its power series and all of them are relying on this one over one minus u. If it's something other than this, like sine of x, we, we don't have anything. That's what 8.7 is about. 8.7 is how do you take a generic function and turn it into its power series. All right, that's called Taylor and Maclaurin series and that's the last, well there's one more section after that, but the section after that is trivial. I, well, no, hold on, no, 8.7 is our last one. Yeah, A7 is the last section that I feel like I have to get through in this class, okay? Taylor and McLaurin series. So that's probably all we're gonna do next week. Do your homework, please. Stay caught up. How long is the video? For the solutions, I'm not sure. <laughs>